Please and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We are in unit four. We now are going to treat Elizabeth Bishop's The Fish. Might be her most famous poem. Some of my sophomores will report this is one of their favorite texts of the entire year. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. We, of course, live in a place where angling and fishing is very, very popular. I think this poem, and let's say it out loud, is one of the great poems for Elizabeth Bishop because it says so much without saying it. I would write that down. It says so much without actually coming right out and saying it. That is to say, it shows instead of telling, which is what all great poets do. Before we get into this poem, though, I want to start at 2B really quickly, and I want to remind you on page 639 that our focus here is the speaker of the poem, reminding ourselves that the speaker and the poet are not always the same, okay? And we're going to hear in this poem a bit of a, like a narrative, a little story, okay, that will be significant. Let's flip over one page to meet Elizabeth Bishop on page 641. Note your dates, 1911 to 1979. Um, the, in 1945, Bishop won a poetry contest leading to the publication of her first poetry collection, North and South, which included the fish. Her work is noted for its powerful images, no doubt. All right, let's go ahead and look at it. 650, the fish. Try as best you can to really follow along with me, hopefully, you're growing more comfortable with learning how to read these poems. I caught a tremendous fish and held it beside the boat, half out of the water, with my hook fast in a corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable and homely. Here and there his brown skin hung in strips like Ancient wallpaper and its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper. Shapes like full-blown roses stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice. And underneath, two or three rags of green weed hung down. While his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening, Gills, fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails and the pink swing, swim bladder like a big peony. I looked into his eyes, which were far larger than mine, but shallower and yet yellowed, the irises backed and packed with tarnished tin foils seen through the lenses of old scratched isn't glass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare. It was more like the tipping of an object toward the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw, and then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like hung five old pieces of fish line, or four and a wire leader with the swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. A green line, frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines, and a fine black thread still crimped from the strain and snap when it broke, and he got away. Like metals, with their ribbons frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. I stared and stared, and victory filled up the little rented boat from the pool of bilge where oil had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine to the baler rusted orange. The sun cracked thwarts, the oar locks on their strings, the gunnels until everything was rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. And I let the fish go. I once taught this poem and a student said it out loud. He was known to enjoy fishing. No way! Well, I have to ask, of course, about this final line. Let's start at level one. It's a simple three-part poem. Let's write it down at level one. What happens in this poem, as I said, one of the things that's really cool about this poem is that Bishop is able to say something without saying it. So here we go. First, she says, dude, I caught this huge fish. 
Unbelievable. Huge fish. I couldn't believe it. She says, I started looking at this fish and I realized two things about it. It was one, really, really old. This was not a young fish. This was an old fish. Two, this fish had been caught a number of times. It had hooks attached in its jaw with line sticking out frayed because this fish had fought and fought and fought to get away and a number of times it had gotten away. Number two, all of a sudden it occurred to me, I have caught the fish no one else could ever catch. Amazing. And it was like all of a sudden I was standing at the top of the world. I take in my surroundings. I see the beautiful colors of the oil and it reminds me of a rainbow. And I realize I have done the one thing I always dreamed of in my life. Catching the impossible to catch fish. Yes, I did it. High five. Part three. I let it go. End of poem. I let it go. What? Now we want to pay attention to exactly what's going on in this poem. Okay? And try and get a sense of what this poem says without actually saying it. What is it that makes this poem so remarkable to so many of my students over the years? Let's begin. Notice, first of all, that the poem will begin with an accomplishment. I caught a tremendous fish. And the description of that accomplishment will go on on page 650 for quite some time. All of a sudden, beginning to identify, whoa, this is an old fish. This is a fish that's been around the block a few times. This is a fish that has seen a whole lot. This is a fish that is no young pup at all, which makes one realize why it didn't fight. Did you notice this? It didn't fight. It's almost as if the fish, you can write it down, had decided, you know what? Enough is enough. I've had enough of it. I'm just going to go ahead, let myself get caught, and be done with it. In other words, I've had enough fighting. I've had enough struggle in my life. This fish basically saying, fine, 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 fine. I'm done. Okay, okay, okay. I know what it's like in my younger years to really fight against the hard strain and to get away. But I'm done. Of course, the speaker of the poem begins to realize something impressive. This fish, all its life, was an incredible fighter. Dare, can we call it a warrior? A fish that kept fighting long after the fact. This fish should have been caught long ago. And yet, there starts to be, put it in your notes, an identification between the speaker and the fish. There's something going on here between the speaker and the fish. Of course, notice as the speaker in the poem begins to realize what it is that he or she has done, there's a certain feeling of accomplishment for the speaker. If the fish, of course, is this amazing fish that can get away, the speaker is beginning to go, dude, I, I, I've done it. I have done the one thing I've always wanted to do in my life. I landed the fish nobody else could land. I broke its spirit. I captured it. I caught it, I did what nobody else could do. And in that moment of recognition, notice, rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. At 3A, of course, we have to remember words where it's, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Total, unadulterated joy, accomplishment. I did it. I have done what I always set out to do. And then, the release of the fish. The speaker, he or she, lets the fish go. Which is obviously going to beg a question. Write it in your notes. Why? Why does the speaker, after catching this old warrior fish, after finding a way to get this fish in his or her boat, the speaker decides, let it go. Let the fish live and turns the fish back into its own. Jot down in your notes why. Why do you think, it's gonna be a two-part question. One, why do you think 
The speaker in the poem lets the fish go after such an amazing accomplishment. And two, do you agree with this? Like, what is the point of this letting the fish go? I thought the whole point of fishing, unless you engage in catch and release, the whole point of fishing is so that you can catch the fish. And of course, this would be the kind of fish that you would probably put on your wall. It's this tremendous fish. It's this huge fish. Why wouldn't you keep the prize? Why would you let the prize go? Why? It makes no sense. Unless we begin to realize the identification between the speaker with the fish. The speaker in this poem is looking at an emblem, a symbol of a true fighter. A fighter, someone who will not give up. That fish that continues to go against the whole notion of being trapped. That is to say, can we say this? That fish represents what and to be for you. What is it a symbol of? A fighter? A struggler? Someone who loves freedom that will not be contained, that will not be caught, that will not be told what to do. Oh, no, you didn't. Uh, that's this fish. That's this fish. No, no, no. You ain't going to catch me. Oh, wait. The fish is willing to live with tremendous pain over and over again. These huge hooks in its jaw. And the fish is willing, it's willing to live with tremendous pain so it can get away. But finally, at the end of the poem, the speaker identifies the aging process. What happens when you've had enough? What happens when you're ready to quit? What happens when you've fought enough? I have seniors that understand this poem better than sophomores because they've done four years of this insanity called high school. And they are ready to be done. They've had it. They've had it. Enough of it. Enough of it. In this poem, the speaker begins to identify with the warrior that had given up. Fine, fine, fine. The moment that the hook sets... It's as if the fish, it's as if the fish goes, oh, not again. I got fooled again. Here I was thinking I was going to get a nice large worm or whatever, a fly, and then bam, the set, and then bam. Fine, I'm not even going to fight it. Fine, 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 take me, you got me, you got me. The speaker caught the fish, catches the fish. Yes, yes, I did it. I... Wait, wait, wait. Who is this? What is this fish? Who is this fish? And the speaker begins to identify with the fish. Whoa, what's it like to go through a whole life of struggle, fighting? You don't give in. When other people give, you don't give in. You fight. Even if it causes pain, you fight. You get away. Your freedom matters that much to you that you are willing to endure tremendous pain to gain that freedom. And the speaker, in the greatest moment of adulation, Yes, I did it. Rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. The speaker identifies something clearly very, very important. More important. See, watch this, watch this. More important than catching the fish is honoring the fish. Yeah? Write that down. More important than catching the fish. More important than the accolade. More important than the honors is the recognition that I'm holding something in my hand that is what I hope to be someday long, long from now. So you notice, you get a sense that the speaker is young. The fish is old. We have comparisons. Let's jump to 2A now. This poem is a poem about what? Respect. What do you mean respect? Well, see, it's a funny thing. If a third grader sits uh, calls you over in the commons area on your way out of school, hey, come over here, sit down, I gotta talk to you. Third grade. Your instincts are what? I'm sorry, first of all, you don't even need to speak to me at all. I got no interest in what. And the third guy's going, I'm not asking, I'm telling. Sit down. I got something to tell. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Our instincts sort of go, oh no, 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 no. Here's the thing. You already understand there should be respect from the young to the old. Think about the last time you didn't show that respect to somebody twice your age. By the way, 
Those are the adults in your life. Twice your age. Last time I checked, a third grader is not twice your age. It's about respect. Why do I gotta respect? What, what do I gotta respect? Wait, wait, wait. You haven't hit 30 yet. They have. That's twice your age. You haven't hit 50 yet. They have. They have. And that fact alone requires a certain level of respect. Why? Because a hook's in the mouth. Hook's in the mouth. It's coming. It's inevitably coming. Remember what Buddha Buddha said after he woke up from his enlightenment under his Bodhi tree, the first enlightenment life is suffering. The hook's in the mouth. It's coming. It's coming. It's only a matter of time. It's coming. And when those hooks in the mouth come, and you got to decide whether you're going to fight or get reeled in, that's called the aging process. And the people in your life who have made it to 30, who have made it to 40, who have made it to 50 and beyond, they got a lot of hooks in their jaws you don't even know about. Until, number two, number two, uh, message. Until you learn how to look right, see. It's what we call perspicacity, inside. Notice, the first instinct is, ha, I caught a fish, yes. The second instinct is, whoa, 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 what do I got here? This fish is like seriously ancient. This fish was a fighter, all its life a fighter. Dude, I really accomplished something. It was me, me, me. And then all of a sudden it hits the speaker, oh. This fish is at the end. I'm going to see this fish differently. I'm not the hero. That fish is the hero. I'm going to let it go. I will not be the one that takes away its freedom. Whoa, what an insight. I will not be that one. Somebody else can do that. That is not going to be me. It is a greater thing to see this fish for what it is and let it go than it is to bring it home and say, look what I caught, look what I caught. Let him live one night, one more day, to fight maybe another day. Let that fish continue to represent the freedom I long for, the courage I long for. Because you only have two options. You either die young or you become an old fish with hooks in your mouth. You cannot live. You cannot live in this world without those hooks in your mouth. It's coming. It's coming. I once had a student that went home, explained his poem to his mom and said, do you got hooks in your mouth? And she went, oh, honey, you have no idea. How hard can it be? You have no idea. You have no idea. The student had never thought of his mother. The next time an adult in your life is giving you garbage, try and see the hooks. Try and see the hooks. They're there. The problem is you're so young, you can't see it. You think you're having a fight. Nah, you don't have a fight. You don't have a fight. You don't have a struggle. You, you haven't lived but 15 or so years. How can you know struggle? I know a lot of struggle. Well, yeah, struggle for 15. Let's double it. Let's double it to 30, and then let's find out what kind of hooks you got in here. What an interesting little poem. Let's jump to 2 V quickly. We said something about speaker. Jot down in your, in your notes really quickly. What do you want to say about the speaker of this poem? Young, maybe we would say. Coming to terms with the fact that there is so much I still have to learn. So much that I don't know. That is to say, humility. As T.S. Eliot says in East Coker, humility is endless. Humility is endless. That ability to recognize... I'm not all I think I am. I'm not all I think I am. Maybe need to, shop, to find a little bit more respect, especially respect for those who have frustrated me at times, who have told me I need to understand something and I wanted to give it back to them. The same way that third grader would want to say it to you. Hey, 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 I don't talk, you talk. You listen, I talk. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, no, no. The way those adults in your life look at you is the way you look at a third grader. 
Think about that. Think about that. That's how they see you. And that age difference, by the way, that's always going to remain, no matter how old you get. Those people who are adults in your life, they're always going to be older than you. That means they're always going to have more hooks in their, in their jaw than you do. That is inevitable. The ability to respect those hooks. Of course, let's make sure we have it in 2B. The symbolism here is profound. The fish, of course, symbolizing what? Old age, the struggle, freedom. The hooks in the mouth represent what? The struggles, the challenges, the things that keep people. Why is it some people give up and quit and other people? I have students that are addicted to certain kinds of narcotics and drugs and drinking. And they will admit it. They gave up. They quit. They were going to fight. They knew it was stupid. They gave up. They got rolled in. And now they recognize it. They are not free. They think they're free, but they recognize it. I am not free. I wish I had not gotten caught. Wow, isn't that an interesting word picture? I wish I had not gotten caught. I allowed myself, I could have fought. I could have fought for my freedom and I did not. Why didn't I fight? A lack of courage. Or maybe a lack of maturity. Because we have one more day. And a poem like this reminds us that fish is let go. He has one more day. At the end of the poem, he has one more day to be free, to keep going to keep swimming, to keep fighting. At 3A, what is the text for you that teaches this so profoundly? What, what text, what is the song that says to you, learn how to see others somehow through different eyes. Try to respect what the old have done. Try to understand. This, by the way, is why when we do say the Pledge of Allegiance or the National Anthem, this is why we stand at attention and show respect. We show respect because those old people have lots of hooks in their jaws. Hooks we cannot understand at all until we learn.